working. Recording. It says it's recording. It's recording. Let's hope it works. I, I lost part of uh, episode one, but uh, the beginning of it was interesting. Welcome to live stream of consciousness episode three, um, where there's no topic except the topics that occur, which is actually uh, what normally uh, happens. But you know, <laughs> it's no true. Determination other than the laws of physics and the topic. Pro arguably, the topic is predetermined, but we just don't know what it's going to be. Well, I mean, we do have a foundation and a basis of, for conversation, so we know it'll be good. So what's new? What's on your mind? What's new? What's on my mind? Oh my gosh, what a question. Current events. So many, so many things. Yeah, so many things, really. Um, well, I don't live in the city anymore, so that's... Um, Changes what's on your mind a lot? Yeah, that's nice. I haven't lived in the city for about a year and a half now. Um, so that's been a nice sort of attention to, um, or a diversion rather, uh, of energy. I found that I was, a lot of my energy was taken up uh, just for, by virtue of everyone else that was around me in the city. But it's been nice to kind of come back to myself a little bit more in yeah in this rural landscape different energy different different um different subjects of thought um i mean honestly i just feel like i've had more time to focus on the things that i've been um been thinking about for a long time and i think this year has presented a sort of acceleration of a lot of the thoughts and things that um had already been sort of present in my mind um and yeah, I feel recently, especially within the last few months, I have a lot more energy for everything as well. Um, I think that I kind of, uh, there was a little bit of a dip and, and a, you know, a res a resigning to things when the pandemic started and then the summer was like a bit of like a chill thing. But then since the fall has come along, it's like, okay, there's like shit that we can do here and needs to be done. Um, so a lot of my time is, is focused on work projects and projects that kind of i hope to seed a better future mm. yeah. so you think that um i'm because I, I at first um I, I was thinking you meant collectively that there's been acceleration of our thought collectively because we've all had time to sit alone in our rooms and think about everything as opposed to just like new input no time to process new input well i think that i think that's arguably true i mean i can only i can only truly speak for myself right but I mean, if the if the uh, you know if the data points of the people around me um, are in any, any indication, then I think that there is some of that sort of collective settling that has um, that has occurred. Um, and yeah, I think like the speeding up of things, I think it does happen. There has been a bit of a leap of consciousness because there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot asked of us and. And a lot asked of our systems that has really kind of, I think, shown a layer of um, something that was kind of functioning invisible in an invisible way that has just come to the surface. Well, it's funny because I think both COVID and Trump did that, um, mm -hmm. even though COVID is arguably part of why Trump is possibly on his way out. Um, but they, they both were sort of stressors on a system of seeing like, you know, what are the tolerances exactly? Yeah. yeah, I really like Chomsky's analysis of the pandemic saying that regardless of where the virus came from, the pandemic came from economics because it's economic reasons that we didn't have surge capacity in our lives or in the hospitals. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with China. Yeah, you know? indeed. Indeed. Yeah, I think a lot of things. Um, I mean, the, the just the way that even the pandemic um, happened with, you know, just the way that economics were in that particular market and, and and not to say that there's any sort of I'm not I'm not um, maybe, that, maybe that was a bit of a weird place to go but I think that you know our sort of um, our use of the resources that are around us in a, in a way that is a bit more I don't know like laissez-faire or less aware of consequences um, I think that 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 is also kind of a could be argued as like a piece of, of a piece of why this happened and I think that um, that underlying sort of reasoning why is 
can be translated into many potential crises that are kind of barely down at us um, that we're just not paying enough attention to how we're interacting with the environment to how we're um, um, to how we're essentially setting ourselves up for failure and um, in yeah, this case disease. Of, speaking of translating, my mind was already translating this to an example that I always find instructive for me at least. I mean, it will depend on the viewer, but um, when people first start doing any kind of computer programming, there's a, a line that's crossed when they finally run out of memory for the first time. And then it's like, oh, I have to factor that in somehow. I have a finite amount of RAM and a finite amount of disk space. Like for instance, there's a lot of programs, especially if you look at old programs, that simply just assume you have free hard drive space. Mm. And when you run into space, they crash. And it's a mystery. And you're like, I wonder why this, it worked before. You know, capitalism worked before too. Um, but what happens when the earth runs out of hard drive space, you know? Yeah, yeah, and really. You know, in, in economic mumbo jumbo, it's the unpriced externalities. But, you know, it's, it's yeah. almost simpler to understand it in terms of computer jargon because people spend more time in the computer than they do in an economics classroom. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, ideally, people would understand it a little bit more at a systems level. I think that there is some clarity that can be found there, but I just don't think that we have, um, we don't really teach that sort of way of thinking. So yeah, good metaphors like that, um, that show systems are really important. Yeah, because the, the, the economic system we have, like, because, you, because if you imagine how would a computer program do this? Well, first, it would say how much space is remaining. Yeah. And then it would say, okay, wh what does it do if we use up half the space? Is that too much or is, uh, you know, two fifths or four fifths or what, like, what are we looking for here? But what's the ratio? Um, but there, uh, as far as I know, there's no part of our basic capitalist setup that says, okay, step one, how much is too much? And then from there, we'll work within that. There's, as far as I know, there is nothing like that in terms of calibrating. I mean, maybe something like Piketty's global wealth tax is intended to be that as sort of like a lever on the whole system. Yeah, yeah, I think you're pinpointing something that, uh, you know, as a meta, a meta sort of structure of input output monitoring, yeah. um, there, there, there isn't a lot built into that. Um, agreed. I think that that that's kind of, um, that's one of the issues It kind of relies on leadership and, um, you know, personal awareness of, of, of how, you know, your of your impact level and, and sort of what it what it's um, what it's doing and then whether that be you know you're a company and it's you're organizing all of these things so you know you have a responsibility to be aware if people took up that mindset then we may be in less of a you know a situation um, so there's all there's a whole bunch of sort of leverage points that I think um, aren't being pulled or utilized um, well, it's interesting the way you set it up there. It, it, it to me it poses some further questions. So, um, we have these unpriced externalities, like it's free to pollute or whatever, um, pretty much. And um, it's funny the contrast I noticed because I suggested, oh, like maybe there's like a basically a mathematical lever of like the wealth global wealth tax that Piketty proposed or whatever. And you proposed that leadership, like say the leaders, like CEOs and stuff, it's their conscience. I guess you're saying that's supposed to. Yeah price the unpriced externalities um so like you know so contrast like a carbon tax versus like um ceos that can't sleep at, <laughs> you know like um obviously those are two points in a space of possibilities but it's interesting the sheer difference between like one's like legal and mathematical and assumes that people are bad people and the other is like well how do we actually get people to be good people mm -hmm. because yeah yeah, because how do you make how do you make a good system out of bad people? I mean, that's kind of the idea of capitalism that like, oh, yeah, selfishness actually is in the collective interest. So um, turns out we can skip the hard work of becoming good people and just use the market. Yay. And then turns out that creates bad people, uh, arguably. Um, yeah, but I mean, the, there's still like the ideologies that went into that were it was, you know, it was it was still coming from a consciousness level. Sure. So I think that we have to be working in the consciousness level as well. Like we have to be working at both the cognitive in the cognitive capacity as well as the emotional capacity, because these two things are what created the problem. So, um, you know, I think that there that there is uh there's work to be done in both ways. And I, and I, and I love, I love that sort of need to just, and, and so sort of instinct to like, look at the biggest sort of lever that we could possibly pull and pull that. And I think that there's a lot to be said for that. And I think we need to be really like, really focused on that, but 
the, 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 the emotional level, I think that, um, that it's going to take, it's going to take an emotional level to even forward that because they're the system by nature is not interested in doing that. So there has to be some sort of like, no, we're not going to let this happen. We're not going to take it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I want to bookmark the concept of talking with some other levers, including like different emotional levers on the whole thing. But um, first I just want to mark, I think you made the exact right connection by bringing up consciousness. Um, because I think that this notion of like an unpriced externality, you know, like the freedom of pollution um, to me, it's, it's kind of a special case of the idea that you can never verbalize everything that's in your consciousness. Our consciousness is so, information rich and to verbalize it you can't even verbalize it all let alone put a number on all of it right you can't even put complex sentences in all of it let alone boil it down to one axis because like a number is more simple than a sentence because a number can be one axis whereas a sentence might describe the entire multi-dimensional system or whatever um so there's all this information that's being thrown away in our consciousness if we switch off if we just look at the numbers and the metrics we're ignoring most of the information, even though we might think there's like an illusion of, look, we read all of the documents. We looked at all the numbers. Yeah, and that's a piss poor assessment because that's 1% of the data. The stuff you can write down is always gonna be like, you know, let's you call it the 1%, uh, the different <laughs> different metaphor. Um, well, they ruin percents for everyone. But, um, <laughs> and um, for me, this is similar to an argument I made some time ago that um, my friend Matt told me was the epistemic argument for anarchism, although I never found a particularly good reference for it. I think he was sort of um, interpreting a little bit based on what he had read. But the, the argument is, is basically like, um, well, the first premise is what I just said, that there's all this extra information in consciousness that you can't verbalize. And if you want to make good decisions, you have to use that information somehow. And so how can you use that information if it can't be verbalized? Well, the only way you can use it is with freedom. Because if you have to report to someone else in words, you can't tell them all of the information that you're basing your decision on. So to the extent that people have freedom to not switch off and to consult their consciousness, um, then they should be able to make decisions based on more information. Like the contrast would be the CEO who's switched off and just looks at the metrics and says, oh, our company's doing great. And the CEO says, okay, but what about the bigger picture? How do I feel about what the company's doing? And of course, there are numbers to look at too. Like you can, there are numbers, it's not as though people don't also ignore uncomfortable numbers. Um, but in, 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 it comes down to, do you want to fire blind or not? Um, to be honest, I don't know if I completely followed mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't so, say it particularly well, but you, you, you captured the first part of it, which is that um, if you don't make decisions in consciousness, you're missing something. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you, and you need freedom to do that. Yeah. Because if, if you have to justify everything verbally, mm -hmm. then, then you're not, you can't use that information. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think you need freedom for sure, but you also need a compass you know you need a compass towards a direction of what are we trying to do what are we trying to create what are we trying to use our freedom for um which i think is another like you know a big piece of the argument you know it's it's not it's it's there is a level of action that is required that we take so it's 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 ideally you know it's well, not even ideally, like we know that consciousness, the actions come from our consciousness. So those actions can either be potentially good or potentially bad. And in most cases, you know, on the, you can see on the rap sheets of companies where like they're actively making bad choices. Like, mm -hmm. like that is not, that's not without our ability to measure and point at and speak sure. to. So, you know, where, at what point do we start to call into the, to the, to question the the type of choices that they're making with their freedom mm -hmm. and 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 i think that that that's a that's a sticky a sticky piece right you know like you can't tell me what to do like and and this is kind of like a, a big a big piece which is i think why um in the work that i do with um in futures work what we really try to utilize is the vision of the future that we're actually trying to 
mm-hmm. you, to create. Because once we have that marker, it's easy to work backwards. Mm, much easier. Especially if it's a felt vision, because I like how you emphasize that there has to there, there has to be some emotional drive that's pushing you in some direction, and like you know, activism often tries to capture that, and often it's very unemotional. The capitalist logic of like, well, we got these numbers to go up somehow, like time to go watch Netflix or whatever. Well, and you know, it's going to be coming to a point in time now where like there is an economic argument for uh, for adapting like it's not about mitig- it's not about mitigation anymore you know the 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 are the, the what we what we require is adaptation and there is an economic uh, you know viability for adaptation and that's something that we're really trying to um to utilize because like the capitalist system is what drives it is, is part of the driver of so many of these conversations so um you know, that's one point that we've kind of uncovered that is really clearly um, that begins to kind of level set and speak some of the same language to kind of get people to like open up their eyes. You mean there's going to be specific economic impacts that are easier for people to quantify and act on at this point? Because it's it's uh, like, like, I imagine you mean like saying the climate example or? Yeah, yeah. So I can be more specific. Um, so yeah, we just finished research um, a while ago that looked at the impact of climate change on real estate evaluation. Oh, oh, I think I heard something about this. Yeah, go on. So, I mean, real estate is, is something that is a really clear sort of m- marker in people's minds as something that is an asset and it, and it, and it uh, tri- it's not just you know certain sects of the population. It's a it <laughs> encompasses a large po- uh, yeah, sector. We all live somewhere, hopefully. We all live somewhere, and a lot of people own property. Um, so there is there is um, an economic argument that says you know your asset uh, is likely to be affected by climate change in X Y Z ways. So now there's an a, a, a economic and emotional sort of touch point in that brings this sort of larger un, uh, you know, un, what's the word? Like it's just this sort of unconscious sort of like monster that's kind of living in the shadows. It's not unconscious, but it's a monster that's living in the shadow. Yeah. Well, sometimes. Um, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. The iceberg bobs up and down in the water. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so yeah, so, it, so if we talk about it in terms of that, and, and, and we can see that you can measure that, like, I mean, mm-hmm. most of the coastlines, you know, like, and these right. are properties that have high, high value and high, right. um, high sort of emotional attachment to why people want to live in the places that they want to live, mm-hmm. um, like if they want to live on the coastline or whatever. So there's, uh, that's one way that we've kind of begun, begun to think about things in a more sort of it, 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 tangible way. Yeah, I, I remember now what I heard about. It was um, a little, I, I don't know when that data is probably maybe from this year or last couple months or something. I think it was maybe, it might've been eight months ago or something. I heard about insurance companies being one of the first places to really reflect this because. Yeah, that is that was the big part of our, our research was. Both the actually, insurance is driving up the house prices. Well, I mean, insurance companies are inherently interested in this. Right. So they're, they're like the insurance companies are actually. Uh, they're not gaming it. Like they want they, the right answer, unlike the Republicans. They want the right answer, yeah. And in fact, you know, um, uh, insurance companies are one of the leading bodies in this space because mm. it just there's just massive consequences for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Some insurance companies could easily go into business in a climate catastrophe. Yeah. Yeah. Forget yeah. a run on the banks. Yeah. I mean, well, there's banks involved, but <laughs> not just it's not just purely economic economically driven in that case. Yeah. Hmm. So um, I was mentioning earlier to bookmark this concept of other emotional levers. So, so we agree that there has to be some emotional force behind things. But one thing I find myself wondering a lot is um, like which emotions. So like, because for instance, um, a couple of years ago when Russell Brand was in his most recent uh, manic episode, he was doing the show called The Trues and like summarizing like bazillion podcasts and um, he, his view he would say this is bad this is bad bad and he'd say what has to happen is there has to be a, like an emotional revolution of people 
caring basically and for him it was about a love and this positive empathy and compassion and he's probably right that that's like the hardest part for people to address because certainly until you're an insurance company effectively or something like that where it is affecting your bottom line in a really measurable way um yeah it does require some compassion to be like oh it's going to affect some other country more like yeah and that's important <laughs> and like um but the thing is because that's harder for people sometimes i wonder if um because because if, if, i mean you, you you might you might have a different view on this um sometimes i think that it's easier to work with the emotions to, to work with people where they're already at so start with the emotions that they have and if you look online people aren't loving and compassionate at all they're they're pissed off and that's not wrong there is absolutely a lot to be pissed off about so I guess the basic idea here is that it's easier to refocus an existing emotion than to replace the emotion with something else. And every emotion has a worthy target. There's there's something worth hating. There's something worth loving. You know, if for any emotion, there's something you should feel it about. So m maybe um, this is just me thinking maybe Russell Brand is too optimistic and maybe we should be more pessimistic and maybe what we need to channel some certain kinds of dark emotions, but at the right targets. Um, you know, like like rage at the corporations or something. I mean, maybe that's the wrong target too, and maybe it's not focused enough. But that's not because that's just what's a corporation's pretty nebulous concept. But mm -hmm. I don't know what you, what you think about that. If one's easier, just to, maybe just depends. Well, I think that you're onto something there. Actually, I just heard a really interesting um, movement that is um, starting being invoked. Uh, by one of them guys, uh, let me see if I can find his name just in case you are interested. Um, but he was talking about, yeah, Rupert Reed. Um, he was talking about a, a book that he's writing, which is called Parents for the Future. And um, speaking about the role that parents have in pushing forward change and he sees that as like a really clear target to mm -hmm. really begin to like move the emotional lever forward. Because if you can operate, if you can, you know, um, take on two basic premises that you love your children and that there's a climate disaster, how do you reconcile those things? Um, and so the parents being the, when you talk about this sort of, you know, what is the, 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 the emotion that is, present the most i mean love and protection for a, for offspring is huge and it resonates like very vastly and with uh, across large populations of people um so there's something i think there's something really powerful about about that and that kind of speaks to like well what is the um, the main emotion that we're trying to like what is the most meaningful emotion to invoke to make change and i think it is it does that's a really you know really powerful one is this preservation of uh of you know a future for your child because it's not just about like putting money away for an education like that's yeah. we've kind of crossed that like and i don't think i don't and i think that the, this is really an untapped mm base that I, I'm really interested and pleased to hear that he's sort of forging it on. And, and in fact, well, there's a big, around my area, there is a big cl climate um, uh, group that got together for with exactly that sort of What's the group? drive. It's called Port Hope for Future. And okay. so it's, it's a, it's, but it was started by parents for this because they had this like, you know, in, in, intense, existential dread right. um and that you know and you, you bring children into the world like you got to take care of them What's and not yeah yeah so but to, to to go back to what you you were talking about i mean mm -hmm. i think that there's a i think that there's a lot of emotions that are going to be needed in order yeah. to move this I'll need them all probably um, and I think that, yeah, it, it's going to, you know, in the case of, for instance, the, the thinking about it from the parents, it begins as a sense of love and, and, and belonging and um, ownership and responsibility, which is something that we could potentially all feel if we just like tapped into the fact that like we're stewards of the earth or like we're just here as visitors for this short amount of time. Like, like what right do we have to like impact the system? And it's 
in this manner. Um, but then comes the sort of anger. And I think that that is going to be required because the fact of the matter is, is that like people aren't people, the, 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 the people who can make a difference aren't. Mm -hmm. And th that, that is anger inducing. Um, right. So it leads me to wonder, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I, I wasn't exactly raised Christian and I converted to atheist later after my mother was more of a spiritual tourist. Um, but maybe I'm going back to my spiritual tourism here again and dipping back into Christianity because I'm going to say, well, what about um, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin? I mean, take it as a, a metaphor or whatever. Take sin as a variable to stand in for what you want to stand in for. I'm not like spouting any specific the theological school or anything like that. But, um, you know, for instance, on the one hand, I've heard something like a Christian critique of social justice in that it does tend to focus on um, sort of hating an individual rather than their actions. Now, maybe that's maybe that's only fair of some quarters or whatever. Anyway, I've heard this critique made. On the other hand, you can hear the critique of Christianity saying, well, Christianity is too forgiving. I mean, look at how it hides abuse. I mean, yeah, that's because they're loving the sinner and that's the whole problem and that they need to hate that person for being, you know, doing hateful things. Um, and it seems to be really hard to resolve this, you know, like, like, I don't know, I think I, I still on some level um, believe the Christian idea. This reminds me of a friend of mine who's, um, she was working in a lab and her professor told her like, yeah, you say you're an atheist, but you're a Christian because all of your morals are Christian morals. Um, and there's even this concept now of being an atheist Christian that you're like, okay, you're an atheist, but like, okay, but what are you really? Never mind what you think is literally true, but like, how do you live kind of thing? And I mean, apply it to the case of the CEO. I mean, it might be different. I mean, I, what I tend to think is that it's different in public discourse than say, like if you're the CEO's child. So suppose like your, your, your daddy is polluting the world. And if, if, you, if you say like, I hate you, I hate you for doing this. I mean, that might open a dialogue, but like if that's, if that's the entire message, it might not produce any kind of reform in that company, let's say any meaningful difference in the car like, like suppose you're this is like if you're the ivanka trump and people you know because people were hoping ivanka trump would or sorry um ivanka i um oh man see i'm just i'm just waiting for the day i can forget all their names his, his, <laughs> i think you've already started no i think that's her name <laughs> that's just, isn't that but i'm just, calling into question myself no his yeah. first wife though anyway forget that example a daughter of a ceo <laughs> um needs to be um supposedly um on this idea appealing to their uh, father or mother saying um what are you doing um but anyway what i'm getting at is that it might be that in public discourse that's more about holding people to account because like for instance in like in an actual courtroom people are like oh like like yes the judge should have compassion and understanding but they're not like oh the judge wasn't nice enough i mean maybe yeah. in some cases that people might say that but it's not it's not a common complaint and it's really only maybe for certain kinds of trials but um, so you might think there's a split that in the public sphere, um, it's guns a blazing critique each other. Like you're the, like, everyone's the politician and like in private, then people would say, oh, okay, well, like, you know, um, I don't, I, I realize that you are different from your actions, you know, and that I, you can have different actions, but maybe what we need is more of a public discourse. That's more like the discourse you would have inside a family because what i what i was getting for what you were saying earlier is that yeah inside families there is this emotion of love to work with so in the family context presumably i mean if you don't have a loving family that's a maybe you got to work on that too but um if you're in a loving family and that is like the root kind of base uh emotion baseline emotion then yeah starting there could work very well um but we don't have that in the public discourse it's it's like it's very much an op uh, oppositional kind of discourse in the public discourse. And that has a different emotion to it completely. Um, and so either, uh, either those emotions are suited to those spheres or those spheres need to expand. Like maybe the public discourse needs to have more of a talk. Like we're all a family. Of course, some people say, well, that's bullshit. Like who treats me like family in the, you know, <laughs> like does Donald Trump think I'm his family? No, he doesn't, um, you know, but maybe that's, but maybe that's the problem. You know, there's like a petition to get Donald Trump to take mushrooms or something <laughs> so from years ago now to try to address this. I don't think he ever did it. Well, I mean, yeah, I think you're saying some some interesting stuff. So I'll just build off some points yeah. that I, I thought about when you were talking. Um, 
something that I've been thinking a lot about is the concept of service. Mm. And like public service. Um, I think that that is kind of a way to think about it, think about this idea in the, in a more, in a public sphere. So when we're bringing this sort of love and, you know, why we do the things that we do for our kids, like, sure, some people might be like, yeah, I'm in service to my kids, but that's not really something that you, that you hear a lot. Like, right. it, it might actually look like that, but. <laughs> Thank you for your service, dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, but I think that, that when it translates into the public sphere, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about how we can be of service to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's actually something that um, I, 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 I see it. I see that, that, that that's something that exists. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think that it's to the degree that it needs to like i don't think that people think about actively think about like how can i be of service to my to the people around me today and like sure some people might but it's just not um it's not part of how we um and i and i'm saying a collective we there's a sort of cultural sort of underpinning that i that i think is present that like (laughs) we're very occupied with 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 showing up for each other. I just don't think we're very occupied with showing up for each other. Um, Uh, We're occupied with a lot of other things. Um, But so, yeah, so that, so, so I think that that's something that, uh, that I'm, that I'm hearing is that there needs to be, you know, if we're talking about this in a public, like, does that resonate with you? Like that concept of, yeah. So if we're talking about it in, 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 in a public way, we think we need to shift how we're, approaching what we do and from a from a service orientation rather than from a take taking take or like an apathy like victimhood like oh woe is me things are happening learned help it's like we need to be a bit more active and like okay how can i show up today Hmm. yeah i i I think yeah because it's probably more common for people to talk about like oh like how's your career going as opposed to like what did you do in the collective interest today exactly yeah, exactly. and, and yeah, no, and when, when you ask if it resonates with you, it resonates with me, not just the concept, but um, your analysis that it's lacking. And I think I've almost had a naivete about that in a lot of cases. I just kind of assume that people are devoting, you know, not not that people are saints, but that people are devoting some of their thinking to like, what can I do to advance society, the collective interest that isn't tied to any specific metric. It's just tied to my opinion and the people of people I've talked to about what they think is good. And obviously there's some there's always a mismatch you know everyone's got a different notion of the collective good which is why it's a little dangerous to say the collective good because you don't just presume oh yeah we're all on the same page clearly we all want the same things like well that's not always true (laughs) which is part of the problem here but yeah well and in fact like I'm going to be so bold to say that a lot of the things that uh, a lot of the sort of collective good um, that has been forwarded has been uh, been forwarded like Sorry, um, I'm going to be so bold as to say that many of the things that groups of people are rallying around and advancing are actually actively against the collective good. Right. Um, and, and, you know, that's something that I, I watched a movie on um, the legalization of abortion. Mm. And and that the, it's, it, you know, the people that were pushing to film? legalize it in the, in the States. And it was like the, the, um, the conviction that this man was speaking with, that it was like, literally he got up every day and his main mission on earth was to <laughs> ensure that abortion was made illegal. And I was like, wow, if only, if only we could like, we could wake up with the conviction of like, my so purpose on earth today is to, you know, make sure I do less harm uh, than, you know, than I do good. And, and I just don't or like to it, make sure that it's legal or to, or to, exactly, or to make sure it's legal. And I'm sure that there are people that are fighting mm, for Alabama. that. And, 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 and I, and, I, and you know, and, and, and I'm sure that there are people fighting against that, but it was just so interesting to me to see that level of conviction yeah. for something that I felt so strongly that was actively against the collective good. Mm. And I, it, it just really goes to show that like, it is about conviction. And why are we still even having the argument that it, it, abortion should be made illegal? Well, because people are waking up with conviction and doing it every day. Right. So 
it's showing the, the t that we can advance things if we just put our energy and our collective you know efforts towards advancing things and again that's when i think it comes down to like why like why i'm so obsessed with futures work is because it really is about forging a collective vision that that actually is based in some sort of um, clarity around what the collective good is and um, i think I, I really truly think that if enough people got around the table the dissenters or the people that are like actively against a, you know a, you know forging a better uh, environmental situation would be not not in the majority yeah that by the light of day we would kind of know what to do hopefully i mean um uh, first of all what was the name of the movie that you're mentioning about uh, abortion yeah that's a good question it was it I'll was just something... look it up we'll put it in a, in a link because I'll, I'll check it out later yeah yeah i'll uh, i'll look it up yeah i'm trying to make a habit of, of, of chasing up all the stuff that comes up in these uh, chats um so um i, I want to go back to something that i put on the stack to talk about uh later in my head um so um we were talking about it being different inside a family and in, in like general public discourse emotionally and um just yesterday i was watching this um a special episode from richard wolf democracy at work talking about worker co-ops and um he said that when he teaches economics he often makes an argument to his class that um um you can see how um a market system can er could erode love within a family and he gives like a trivial example of someone like you know like um trying to ch charge their parent four dollars for something and he's just like oh yeah the market value of me doing the dishes is four dollars and like and he's saying like well it's obvious to people how in a family that's like you're supposed to be doing things for a different reason and so he says something like um he says that he says to them something like so if a market can erode love within the family maybe it can do that in society generally now he's not anti-market in 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 total because he's like yeah even plato and aristotle were arguing about markets but the markets regulations have shifted to reflect the dominant ideology whether it's feudalism or capitalism or the future he envisions which is one with a lot of worker co-ops mm -hmm. which he says would reduce income inequality and actually he made a proposal there that he hasn't usually made he's actually richard wolf has started now proposing a political party devoted to co-ops that would be basically advertised on the walls of every co-op so he's he's kind of upping the ante on what he's proposing right now because at first he was like yeah learn more about co-ops more people should make them now he's like there should be a political party which is about converting the economy to worker managed cooperatives which would reduce income inequality and um you know there's a lot of other decisions that as you're saying if you get people around the table where the power is really evened out the decisions would be very different because i think in general it's just sort of like um the curse of oligarchy if choices are made by a subset over time the choices tend to reflect the interests of that subset if the subset is very large, it'll take longer, or may, or maybe if you constantly change the subset, there isn't time. For, and that's kind of the idea of having uh, term limits, right? Because if you're president for life, then gee, I wonder over time the Supreme Court's going to be all people who agree with you or whatever. Speaking mm -hmm. of abortion, um, so anyway, yeah, um, that, that 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 at least is part of the problem. It could be that even if everybody was involved in the decision making, there's still further problems. You know, like some people are. You know, it, it, it gets complicated looking at different voting systems and stuff. But um, yeah, that's um, it, it connects. It connects a, a couple of things here of the emotional disposition and and because um, uh, you were giving this example of people waking up with conviction, and he was talking about going to a worker co-op and and telling them um, the political context of what they're doing. Like this is important. This isn't just a random economic experiment. Like you guys are the future. This is what needs to happen, and just kind of inspiring them with that kind of narrative um it can make a big difference if because if even if even if you're doing the same boring job but you know that the political structure is different then in some small way you're helping change the system even if you're doing the same work you know i, I think it makes a huge difference in motivation and it can help you contextualize in, in the whole project of like we're working together to be more cooperative we're cooperating to cooperate uh it, it would be the general plan you know <laughs> as opposed to you know just necessarily bottom line or whatever yeah, for sure. I think you're speaking to something really interesting and important. I mean, there's all sorts of mindsets that are that have that are entrenched that are causing problems. And I think that that's like a really, really deeply important mindset of um, just just being act, asked to participate and make 
you know, decisions that um, are meaningful and reflect um, uh, and, and that contribute to purpose. And I think that our work is really a way that we can do that. And yeah, I think co worker co-ops is, um, I, I have admittedly haven't studied them very much, but they make a great deal of sense to me for- yeah, You know, Richard Wolff hadn't studied them either in his many degrees of economics, because he was saying they don't teach you that, they don't teach you Marxism at all, even in economics. They don't teach you anything um, that's sort of against the established system. Um, so um, it's not your fault or my fault that we don't know much about this. It's, it's sort of a, I mean, in 10 years, it'll be our fault if we still don't know anything about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Dude, yeah. But, you know, uh, Richard Wolf was saying that he never expected to be this popular. He thought he was going to be like a, a obscure underdog for his whole life, but that situations, conditions have changed so much now that there's more of an appetite for, for what he's saying because people are starting to get pissed off, you know, not that they weren't pissed off before, but they're, they're getting more pissed off. And um, I mean, his view is that there's a sleeping giant of labor, that the labor movement is due for a resurgence. And I think that's probably right. I mean, it's, um, I, I think it was Chomsky who said that every, every person in like a centralized position of power kind of knows that that's the implicit power of people to organize. And so they start from the get go if they know the history of labor from the get-go, if they want to have that kind of power, they're going to try to disrupt things like labor movements. Yeah. Um, in this show, they were saying, well, can't these labor movements, can't you strike and go a step further and demand worker management? And that might be what, what happens. And, you know, he went through a lot of the Jeremy Corbyn stuff. So maybe the UK is a bit ahead of us, at least in terms of bringing this up in the, in the central political narrative, right? Because there is um, I'm sure a lot of debate that I didn't see across the pond about Corbyn and because his, his whole proposal was that every company can become a worker co-op if it gets sold or bought at first, the right of, right of first refusal. Yeah, well, I mean, and there's such a precedent for it there anyways. Like, I mean, mo the UK history is founded in labor movements. It's like, it's been integral to, um, to their historical evolution. So um, that doesn't surprise me um, that there that there that there's more thinking that's been done there. I mean, I I, I think again you're onto something with the with the describing it as a sleeping giant. Like really, I think that that's what it, what it's about. Kind of trying to understand and activate is the sort of collective forces. Like when we think about when we think about you know. Um, and it's not about necessarily identity, identity, but it's about what people can identify with, and how can how is what they're identifying with uh, being um, how is what they're identifying with? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, they have to identify with a cause, not just yes, like, exactly. It has identity. to be has to connect with their identity. Yes, it's, yeah. So, so there's lots of different identities that we can see that have actually spurred on great collective movements when we think about historically. I mean, in the, in the all along, like your identity is, you know, a woman or is a black person, like these, these identities, you know, and seeing the injustices that were occurring as a result of like your, your, uh, your identity spurs people on to action and to, to make change. Um, of course, you can imagine. So, like, let, let's do the juxtaposition then. So, imagine there's a, like a two by two matrix of like male, female, pro life, pro choice, right? So, like, one identity is are you male or are you female, and the other identity is are you pro life or are you pro choice? And I would I would think that being now, yeah, there's probably going to be some correlation because I think women are going to understand the reasons to be pro choice sooner or more easily than men, I think it's, it's, it's like an unpriced externality. It's like, we don't understand the effects of pollution on another country we've never been to. Um, so there's going to be a correlation there. But but um, the correlation aside, um, you know, I, I political political effectiveness probably comes if you had to not that you have to choose. But if you had to choose like on as a first approximation, political effectiveness would probably come more from people rallying around the cause of being pro choice rather than the group of like, we're men or we're women. It's like, well, okay, well, <laughs> now, now maybe that most of the women, if they really thought about it, would end up pro-choice. I mean, although maybe that's just my, uh, you know, existence in liberal Toronto speaking. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think you're right to kind of, that there is like certain sort of levels of identification or reality, but, but I heard something interesting yesterday that was talking about the role that um, women fighting for 
um, in the civil rights movement played to spur on the fight for uh, equality. Right. So there's this like, there's this sort of like recognizing of like, you know, and championing like, that's not right. And then being like, wait a minute, Neither is that. <laughs> that that does that applies to me too, to in a different way. Right. So, um, you know, there's a there's a sort of plural plurality that plurality that yeah. kind of comes with like how we think about ourselves and how we you know identify with what's going on around us that I think is is actually really challenging to assess. And so it's about kind of giving like putting out a lot of ways that like you know, ideally that people can understand and identify with. So, I mean, the labor- different people understand it differently, what, different ways you mean. Yeah, exactly. Try as many formulations as possible of the same idea. Exactly. You upset different people with different formulations of the truth. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But I think the labor one is 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 pretty on the money. And um, uh, I, I'm curious, I'm curious to see what, like the potential for that. Um, yeah. What do you think some other other levers are or other other ways? levers i did uh, yeah levers of sort of mindsets or... well there's general strikes right so, so that's been yeah well, that was tried about a year ago in toronto like i mean it was a global general strike you know i don't know what percentage of the world participated in it um you know general strikes have been very powerful in the past like the winnipeg general strike and that kind of thing um, yeah it, it seems to me that that um basically well there's a, a general pattern i think over i don't know 40 years maybe it goes back further of uh, divide and conquer via commodification i feel the same thing happened in music and music being parceled up into little products instead of being a political force and i think the same is true of labor movements that if you have a strike it's just a garbage strike usually or it's a teacher strike or it's, you know, it's just one industry um, the general strike is a lot more threatening to the established powers or system and um, like the student strikes in Quebec during the Maple Spring, I mean, they've had many, which is why their tuition is low. Because uh, people were in the English language, they're like, why are they striking? Their tuition is low. Yeah, it's because they strike. <laughs> um, the whole history of it. Um, the, um, the student strike in Quebec during the Maple Spring, Maple, Maple Spring, during the Maple Spring forced a provincial election. Um, they had to have an early election to like quell all the chaos uh, reportedly when there were a lot of people joined the students in sympathy at like the peak of the political action the number of people in the streets in montreal counted as the largest act of civil disobedience in canadian history and it wasn't exactly a general strike although for a moment it was because people like left their i, I imagine that like it may probably depends on where you work at the second cup maybe you can't do it but i imagine people left their shops and stuff and, and came out to some degree or maybe all these people had free time I don't know, but you know, so maybe technically it wasn't a work stoppage, uh, other than of the students who were making the argument that like we are workers. Just to say that it's a boycott is to miss the point entirely, because some people were saying it's not a strike, it's a boycott. They're not workers, they're customers, and they're like, no, that's the issue. We're not supposed to be customers. Um, at any rate, um, so like mass strike action like that can do things. It, it forced an election in in Quebec, um, provincial election. Um, I think it's possible to try to. Um, do a lot of polling alongside the existing slow system. Um, I was just having some chats with a few friends about this idea of trying to make a, an app or a website that just um, asks you if you agree with your representative when you're represented. Like, oh, somebody voted to represent you. Do you agree? Um, yes or no, or undecided. And then you can just do the stats of who's the most representative representative. It would be like the sunshine list. And I that love kind that. Of, yeah, I, I hope that can be effective. Um, some of us are looking into a little bit, but um, if there's any software developers listening to this, please help us out because actually it should be an, it should be an easier project than it is for me at the moment because I'm a little rusty. <laughs> um, it's like, um, but also I have this subconscious block sometimes. I think, well, if nobody else wants to implement it, maybe there's something wrong with the idea in the first place, and I should go back to the drawing board, which sometimes is true. Sometimes you're like, this seems so obvious. Why doesn't anybody do it? Um, sometimes there's a very good reason that you've missed. Um, and you can save time by thinking about it. But sometimes that just stops you. And it's like, because everyone else has the same question. Everyone else, it's like a cultural, it's like an innovation bystander effect of like, well, this looks like a good innovation, but no one else is doing it. So it's like, yeah, but that would be the definition of an innovation. It has to be something that no one else is doing. That's actually what you're looking for. But like, but I feel crazy because no one else is doing this. 
you know it's like, that's a know. very vulnerable articulation i think of you know why we why we uh why some projects forge ahead and some just fall by the way wayside so thanks for that and as you say it's, it does come down to conviction you have to wake up with conviction and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wake up with a certain kind of conviction, but it's very diffuse because, you know, I'm a very uh, thinking in parallel kind of person. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very much the same way. I go through like parts of my day where I'm like, wait a minute, why is this happening? I get a lot mm -hmm. of conviction about a certain thing and then there's a lot of focus on that. And then there's like, you kind of get to a, a breaking point and then something else emerges and then you walk away and you have like, you know, six projects on the go, which are, <laughs> you know um but but i think i think um i think well one that's why collaboration is key because you know it's it's not just up to one person like it's got to be it's got to be a collaborative effort um so i mean that speaks to one one thing uh, another about finding your people and, uh. and you know um ensuring that these sorts of projects can happen because there's 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 momentum behind it yeah i mean another lever that's possible like in taiwan the government commissioned software basically to improve democracy like in taiwan all the dot gov websites you can change the o to a zero and go to like the shadow government website where the people can have their own opinion and so on and you know the it's government here could commission something overnight I mean, unfortunately, there'd be a yeah. lot of, they have to have some meetings and convince some people. Honestly, there must be some government body who could just be like, we want to commission, um, you know, a, a prototype and then they'll vote on it later. What they're doing instead is they're doing antitrust against Facebook. This is just in the news um, this morning, yeah. more about it. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting, although they, they, they cited something I had forgotten that Mark Zuckerberg had said, but I do remember at the time, it was maybe second last time this came up, that he said, um, if Facebook were to be broken up, he would just dissolve the company. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a game of chicken. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean, oh, but the. Oh, woe is us. No more Facebook. Like, uh, something else will come. Yeah, because Facebook is not innovating because it's monopoly. Like, like, when's the last time Facebook, like, Facebook makes changes that annoy people, but like, they could be uh, asking us to vote on like anything. Yeah. They, could, they could be asking for our input you know i mean so could the government but facebook already has the software they already have the software developers like i understand more so why the government's not innovating very quickly like when congress tried to build a website back in the day it was a clusterfuck so it's like yeah the government is like behind the curve but um facebook is just not in their interest it's pure selfishness uh the selfishness yeah. of that monopoly position that you know they they, they could be like when Cambridge, the Cambridge Analytica scandal happened, I actually wrote Mark Zuckerberg for the first time. I said, now's your chance to push direct democracy software via Facebook. Because that, yeah. that's what they could have done. They could have said, oh, this Cambridge Analytica scandal makes Facebook look anti-democratic or like it interferes with the democratic process. Let's flip our image and say, we are Facebook. We are pro-democracy. We will bring democracy to the world and without US wars. You know, that could be their brand. Yeah. You know, they're already blue. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I but mean, I think that's, you know, that's, that's, that's less of a sure thing financially for the individuals making the decisions. Yeah. I mean, everything you're pointing to when, uh, if I was to sum up sort of the, the lever that you're, that you're pinpointing, it's the um, feeling of participation, the mindset of participation in society that is uh, also just been like completely eradicated because of the lack of opportunities to participate. And I think what's really interesting about the Montreal um, example that you gave is that, you know, Montreal has a different Culture. electoral mm. structure. Their neighborhood borough um, community um, uh, engagement is way more robust. Like you can walk in in your borough and, you know, like it's super easy. It's like, you know, it's like you can raise anything that you want. It's like there's people, the people who are elected are done so in a way that is um, really open, and um, there's all these sorts of values that are that underpin 
particip that un underpins electoral system that is, is way more participatory and way more transparent mm -hmm. that I think um, is uh, perhaps one of the way one of the reasons why there was more conviction and turnout for that general strike because there is this clarity that like you can make impact mm. and i think that that's actually the mindset that we're really talking about here is that yeah. participatory function and people just don't feel like they are an active participant participant right. in the democratic system it's just or that they even have an obligation to be or that they have an obligation to be which is like you know it's kind of basic like you, yeah you that's curious but yeah i don't yeah. i I don't think people uh, people aren't taught and people don't realize how much obligation we each have as an individual to make this a democracy. Because, you know, if you want authoritarianism, then yeah, it doesn't matter what you know or what you think because someone else is supposed to know and they're just going to tell you. But when it's up to everyone, then like it's up to everyone. Like, I don't know, I, I feel like it's, it's um, the seductiveness of the easiness of someone else telling you what to do is something everyone falls prey to of like oh i just i just want someone to tell me what to do and this is so much easier and like because you know i'm probably got it wrong anyway and like yeah which is why we need to all get it wrong publicly uh and sort it out you know yeah yeah that's that's something really interesting that you're um that is is i think it resonates more on an emotional level this sort of uh, you know, need to be taken care of and, you know, not mm. take as much, you know, radical responsibility for your life or things that are happening around you, uh, which I think is like pretty root to a lot of narratives that exist in people's minds all the time. But yeah. the other thing, the other narrative that I think that this kind of brings up and that's sort of the, the, the other way that you see a lot of people sort of disengaging is like, they don't know anything. Like, what have they done for me? Um, which is a bit more of a, a hostile, I would say, um, oh, don't approach. Tell you anything. Sorry? You no, but you said, oh. The attitude of, I don't owe people anything. Is that what you said? Um, I, I heard you right. I said, um, they, they don't know anything. Like, yeah. there's this idea that, like, the government is, the like, government yeah, you the know, that it's incompetent, it doesn't you know, what God, good does it do for me? And, and to an extent, I understand that because it is really, it, it is kind of challenging to see, but at the same time, it's all around us. Like we have roads, we have electricity, we oh, have oh, like, yeah, yeah. we have like, we have an entire society that's, you know, been built and based upon the efforts of people that um, uh, have, uh, you know, been embedded in the structure of government to do so. So it's, um, it's a bit of a weird take, but I think that that's also a mentality that this sort of system is up against that um, needs to be considered as well. And I don't know if just by virtue of just giving people the ability to participate, if that's like the solution, it's, but I think it's, it's it apparently helps. not sufficient. I mean, um, there's a very interesting podcast um, folks can watch with economist Michael Albert going on a Gamer's Destiny, uh, Gamer Destiny's show. I don't really know much about Destiny, but this is how I learned about Michael Albert. And um, I mean, he's kind of, from a bird's eye view, he's in the same ballpark as Richard Wolff, although um, I believe they have disagreements that I haven't looked into yet, but they're both in favor of worker cooperatives, um, worker managed cooperatives. And um, Michael Albert described, I forget, where it was, I think it might have been South America, he was describing some cases where um, these companies were converted to worker cooperatives. And um, there were these, you know, worker management meetings. And he said that one of the first things that happens at these worker management meetings is they all vote to make the meeting optional and stop showing up. <laughs> it's like, it's like voting to make class optional or something like that. Um, and so he's like, well, so that's a problem. Um, and his solution, although, um, you know, Destiny was very skeptical of it for, I think, good reason, because I don't know if it's ever been done. But his proposed solution, um, I mean, maybe it has been, I don't know the example, or maybe I forgot, but um, his, his proposed solution is to rebalance jobs. Because he said that the reason people don't participate is that their jobs, the, the, the experience they get from their job is in no way directly relevant to the decisions being made at the meeting. And the way to change that is to change how people are spending their time so that at least 20% of their time is spent doing something which somehow connects to the meeting. Otherwise, they're just kind of voting blind. Like if you if you work for a, 
I don't know, you, you work for like a, a bus driving co-op and all you do is drive the bus all day. Um, you're not going to really know about like the fleet level, like traffic congestion issues or something, if that's what they're talking about for a whole hour at the meeting. And you're like, I could be out driving people around rather than listening to this. And, but if 20% right. of your job wasn't driving in the first place, it was like, I don't know, I don't even know how it works. You're at some control center looking at traffic flow maps or something. I'm just making up how the transit industry works, but <laughs> <laughs> you think outside the box, guys. <laughs> just make it seems like a good work. estimation, but, but. I mean, if you're ma <laughs> making up shit that won't work might work <laughs> because making up nothing definitely won't work. Yeah, 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 but, for sure. But I my think... point being is that the participation is supposed to be encouraged by rebalancing the jobs on that proposal. Other possibilities yeah. would be like paying people to come to the meeting and that kind of thing. Incentives, you know, it's, yeah. it's either incentives or, um, you know, uh, what is, what would be the other thing that you're speaking to? Well, intrinsic motivation. motivation. Yeah. yeah. Intrinsic yeah. and extrinsic motivation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause the extrinsic motivation gets gamed because, um, you know, if you pay people to come to the meetings, they might vote to make lots of meetings then which is actually effectively what happens when your whole job is going to meetings and you're like, yeah, our organization needs lots of meetings. Right. Yeah. Those are easy. <laughs> That's easy. We're like 30 bucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everybody's thinking at a lot of these meetings. They're like, Hmm, this was easy. <laughs> yeah. And just, and just look at, you can just look over time at the bureaucratic bloat in universities, right? It's just like, it's like, <sighs> like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're speaking to a real thing. So yeah. Motivation uh, more intrinsic motivation is, um, I think it, 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 well, yeah, I think it's definitely required. Yeah. Cause I don't think Michael Albert discussed the idea of just paying them because maybe he felt that would just be game anyway. Cause I, cause I think his, he was focused on intrinsic motivation implicitly. And I think the idea is that the job experience of the relevant issues would give you more intrinsic motivation to affect the decision. Um, but yeah, that's, that's supposed to be a, a, a sort of a, a hurdle that co-ops run up against is getting people to actually participate just because it's the same with our actual elections. Everybody can vote and everybody does. Yeah. Um, you and could usually... just make it mandatory, but then the thing is that if the workers have enough power, they could vote to make it not mandatory anymore. So this is where I think a lot of things where it gets really complicated and where I need to do more research and so does everyone probably is I think when you get into meta voting, because like, like if propositional reform, uh, sorry, electoral reform like pro proportional representation, uh, propositional reform sounds like some mad philosopher's project. <laughs> propositional reform, all propositions need reform. <laughs> um, electoral reform with proposition, proportional representation, Yeah, um, it's a kind of meta voting because you're voting on how to vote. And I think in the context of software, we might be able to do simulations and, and um, accelerate this. I was actually, I was just reading a paper last night about simulations of voting systems that came out this year. And um, I noticed they made a very subtle assumption, which is not true. They said, um, they're assuming that there has to be a fixed function. And uh, so their, th their goal is to pick a voting system. In, in this paper, the implicit goal was to pick a voting system for a purpose and then use it, as opposed to having voting systems which are changed via the votes. Like your use of Facebook could involve things which change Facebook other than just the weights in their machine learning algorithm. You could you know, every month they could have a poll on the default title color. You know, imagine if Facebook's actual global brand was democratically controlled by its color. It's, it's trivial in a way, but in another way, it's also impossible. It would never, like if it's so trivial, why would it never happen, right? Because it sets a precedent. Mm -hmm. if, once you can vote on the color, well, you can vote on everything else and you can vote on the voting system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think you're speaking to uh, both things: the motivation to keep things the way that they are, and also the the need and the and what it would what type of motivation would be required to change things. So, um, you know, balancing that, I think, is the ultimate tension, right? Is like there's there's there it, there has to be a, a relinquishing of power in order to even make the the this sort of um, to, to even uh, ensure that this sort of mindset could even flourish. Yeah. And that's, and that's something else that we're facing is that people aren't interested in relinquishing their power. Yeah, there's also a question of proof of concept. I think, cause I think there's a bit of a um, brain drain and just talent capture. I think most people with programming skill are already paid well to basically maintain the existing system. Yeah. And most people obsessed with politics are obsessed with politics. Not, uh, it, it ends up being, 
like Christ, when Donald Trump got elected, I quadrupled my consumption of media to figure out what the fuck was going on. And like the New York Times gave Hillary a 98% chance of victory. Like I, tr I trusted you, like what's going on? You can't um, be my only source anymore. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, gone are the days where I just watch Rachel Maddow and Jon Stewart, like great people, <laughs> but like, I, I, yeah, if, you don't, if, if your sources don't contradict each other, you're not making up your own mind about anything, so. Yeah. Um, which is what we need everybody to do, uh, really. But um, I forgot what I was talking about. I started ranting about sources. <laughs> you were talking about the need for uh, essentially a, a innovation. Oh, pr proof of concept. Mm -hmm. So, like, if if um, like in Taiwan, uh, to me, Taiwan is the proof of concept of we could have better software that does encourage a lot more democratic participation, and the government could fund it itself. It's yeah. not that different to the Corbyn proposal in the UK, where um, Richard Wolff explained this thing yesterday. Uh, I'd forgotten this detail that um, when people say, "Yeah, but where are the workers going to get the money?" These workers—that's the whole problem in the first place. Is if the issue is income inequality, workers don't have the money to buy out a company. And he's like, "Yeah, but the government can lend it to them." Yeah. Oh yeah, the government could lend people the money to buy out their company uh, before it goes public, and the government could commission software. Yeah. You know, I mean, right now they're talking about breaking up Facebook and like in a simple way, you could break up Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp, right? You could divide them all up because they're not, uh, you know, their interoperability could remain to the extent that there isn't. You'd expect there to be more, but the, anyway, um, it's much harder to like draw a line in the middle of Facebook and be like, okay, everybody in the Americas is on one face. Like, how do you divide it? You know, like, cause it's a mm -hmm. social network. You can't just, you'd have to, what you could do is you could divide it by, um, this isn't really the same thing, but it's analogous because one thing, for instance, um, like Jack Dorsey's mentioned this in a few universe, interviews saying that, and actually Stephen Wolfram proposed this to Congress because Stephen Wolfram said like, guess what? You can't actually predict everything that's gonna happen. Computers are complicated, it's computational irreducibility, but you could give people control to turn the algorithms off. And you could give people choice of, a, of third party algorithms. So I think what will happen is that you won't break up the social network if, if the antitrust goes through against Facebook, although be, it takes as long as it did with Microsoft. But if the, I mean, the thing is that the politicians are getting pissed off right now because both sides, both sides of the aisle are pissed off at Facebook at this point because they both feel like they've lost their power. And they have, and that's why they were like, whoa, Facebook's developing a currency, you're gonna stop right now. And they shut down Libra right away. They're like, this is enough. Like you're not making your own money too. Um, and so both sides of the aisle want to do something about it. And I think what they'll do is that they'll say that, well, Facebook, you control this social network, but you don't control the algorithm anymore. We're going to separate you. One part of Facebook makes the algorithm. Another part of Facebook just like administers the social network and like extensions and whatever. And then you could switch. You could say, okay, you know, uh, Facebook algo, whatever the company's called, that does the algorithm. I don't use you anymore. Now I'm going to use Twitter's algorithm for my Facebook feed, or I'll use Facebook's algorithm for my Twitter feed. I think I think that's the most sane thing that can happen in a short term, other than just developing an alternative, which is what Taiwan is kind of doing. Like it's not their software doesn't replace Facebook, but it it, it fills in the governmental role of, of having software that's like Facebook for governmental purposes and like political purposes. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know much about Taiwan, but they are making me curious. Oh, everybody, go watch this show called Steal This Show when they interview Audrey Tang the uh, was it digital minister of taiwan okay. um following uh, there's also a good interview with rick falvinge the founder of the pirate party uh, and you can see um what's happening in taiwan as like the taiwanese pirate party in fact i, I dug up a tweet uh, once from audrey tang because i was trying to figure out why isn't there a pirate party in taiwan or is this connected to it and i found out that in taiwan the pirate party could was never allowed to exist because you can't have a crime in the name of your party and piracy is a crime so there is no Taiwanese pirate party, but the closest thing to it is what Audrey Tang is involved with following on the Sunflower Movement. Because in, in a way, they're kind of like the next step. Uh, you know, the, the pirates had a few upswings here and there, but they're kind of on the decline, at least in terms of electoral numbers, which is why I think we need other software alternatives to work around the existing system. Yeah. But in, but in Taiwan, they had the government on side. And it's partly because democracy was very young there, is very young there. So there's more of a cultural understanding of like, we need to increase it. Because right. here we're like patting ourselves on the back. We're such a democracy. <laughs> we're so great. It's like, no, you're not, 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 not much. You barely got started. You're supposed to have now more democracy, democracy in the workplace, like Richard yeah. Wolf, democracy in schools, like in Sudbury schools, or, you know, democracy in our democracy with more direct democracy. Yeah, yeah, I know. There's this sort of like, it, it's a sort of like sort of, sort of false achievement of like, yeah. we've done it. And then Mission it's like, accomplished. We've, we, yeah, like, what? 
um, keep up with culture, <laughs> things change. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think I think that's really interesting. And to me, what that ultimately the, the sort of the, the piece that it's that is, uh, harking to is choice. Mm. And I think it's it's choice to choice. And um, on top of that, like critical, critical choice is like the choices that you're being asked to make require some sort of critical mm. thinking that I think is really important it's not just like what am I going to watch on Netflix tonight which you know may be a critical choice for some people but it also might just be like whatever their algorithm suggested and like it just there's some we have to understand that the the that there the critical thinking that goes into making choices like you know that people are making at a government level or at a high at a corporation level they have to be being made by people average people every day and not saying that all choices aren't critical but we need to feel more engaged to understand that there can be critical choices that are made that have great impact um and then that resin that ripples that level of responsibility will ripple out into more minor choices that still have critical impact like whether or not you you know recycle yeah i mean like like i, th I think people um people are too worried about assuming their choices matter more than they do. Like, 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 oh no, like, like what, what if you accidentally were like too responsible of a citizen? <laughs> like, oh, well, <laughs> then, then, okay, you wasted a bit of energy, but like it's practice though. You don't know, like what, you only get so many opportunities to practice caring about what you're doing and what the results are. And like, so like practice in every action, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean you have to be a consequentialist and, and, um, uh, like consciously calculate everything because that's that's not realistic i mean sometimes you do sometimes you appeal to a principle but um it's, it's, there's, there's there's an opportunity everything's a, a practice opportunity every exactly yeah it's that practice function i think and the and and the, the reflection that has to come from that so mm -hmm. you know when we talk about what is what what is when we talk about critical choices the critical thinking that's in that is based in um you know deciding um like weighing your options and uh so knowing more about more things and reflecting about whether or not that that's you know whether or not you did or didn't make the right choice so the there and th that basis of knowledge is something that like is really important for us as humans that um um is a function that i think has been muted quite a bit in how we um, show up to the world. Yeah, the, I thought in passing when you were drawing the contrast between um, uh, Netflix versus thinking critically, I was thinking, I mean, I wish, you know, I would pay for Netflix if Netflix added a feature where it will warn you if everything you're watching expresses the same worldview. Like warning, nothing you watched contradicts anything else that you watched. Um, you know, I wish Facebook could tell people that like warning, you, you haven't seen two contradictory propositions in three years everything i mean that, that wouldn't actually happen for that quite that long but like it might be that like all of the articles you read to the end don't contradict each other which could be collusion you could be in an echo chamber you could be reading the new york times that says hillary has a 98 percent chance of victory yeah yeah what what power that is to show to show to show that i think well, that that's and the fact that everybody's fascinating seeing different now like it used to be that you had to show like you had to television like yeah people could be watching different tv stations but it's it's not as different for every person as it is now because like you know a, a liar could manipulate people that way they tell every person something different uh or, or some people something different if there isn't that market efficiency of the you know the light of day uh bring it all together when when people have um um i mean a public facing conversation on youtube is hopefully a bit less like that because i feel like the facebook algorithm is particularly bad in this way of like putting people into their own little personal bubbles in terms of what it chooses to show you in, in the news feed i mean youtube is a bit more based around subscriptions and there's the notion of like an episode and also you hear people talk so you don't have to like jump to like the worst interpretation necessarily i feel like people people can communicate better with like more cues as well so that's helpful as well i feel like i'm starting to ramble now <laughs> It might, that might be a sign that we're starting to run a material. I don't know what's on your what's on your mind. Anything, anything that you feel we we need to really um, cover that we were already talking about? 
I mean, I think um, just to kind of um, maybe draw out some themes um, would to sum up uh, would be that there's a lot of there's a lot of levers that can be looked at um, from a lot of different angles, um, but the and when we're looking at sort of the legal the, the levers that we're choosing, there's like a thinking you know cognitive sort of more data based thing that has to be functioning, but there's also this sort of need for those things to resonate on an emotional level, and we need to kind of begin to think about those two things in tandem or in um, at least in consequence to each other um, in order to understand, you know, what, what something is going to create or invoke. And, um, and, and I mean, again, there is the, the, the possibility to also work backwards, I think is, is, is key. And so if we want to, if we were, if our goal is to create a more democratic society, well, then all of these things that we've been talking about, you know, then those can become the, um, the ways in which we, we do that. And the, uh, I think, what was the word you use? The, uh, start with a C. In what context? Um, no, it's gone okay. out of my brain. Well, we'll check it later. Yeah. But it's the, it's the way, it's the, yeah, these things have to be considered. Um, and so, and, you know, and just to kind of draw it down e e even a little bit more clearly, I think what we're really talking about is like, we're talking about things that are functioning on a, on a personal level, this personal scale and sort of internal level, but we're also talking about things that are functioning on a societal level. We're talking about things that are functioning on a systemic level. And there's all of these different levels that need to be addressed and, att and attuned, uh, your, your vision and your solutions need to be attuned to, to understand how they're functioning and how they're, they're best sort of pushing forward the agenda. Right. Um, that, that brings to mind a few other uh, things for our little uh, closing segment here. Uh, sure, closing so segment. Like, um, I was mentioning earlier how Richard Wolff has this thing that he likes to say to his classes about like, you know, maybe markets erode love outside the family as well. And um, what I forgot, I was thinking about the contrast to what you also hear. I mean, I've heard Peterson say it, I've heard a number of people say it, that um, um, socialism, Marxism, et cetera, whatever you want to call it, maybe it works on a small scale, but it doesn't scale up. And that, that would be the challenge to meet is how do you scale up? the compassionate logic of a family to a larger scale like for instance if you if you read Aldous Huxley's island that's his utopian novel that contrasts with brave new world and the fact that it's an island is very significant because that's the idea that like once there's this like international politics you can't just like be a nice connected community anymore because that's how the utopia is destroyed by being pillaged by an external nation for its resources a much larger nation an authoritarian nation but if that island had been the only island in the world, the implication of the novel, you can believe it or not, but the implication of the novel is that it would have worked. It was the whole island was like one happy family. Basically. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I think there's a million ways we can think about, I mean, sometimes it is literally having a larger family in the sense of polycules and polyamory, or it's just a sense of that emotion of caring about people. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think the fact that people can't, um, can't literally imagine scaling up the family literally is a conceptual block to scaling it up in a metaphorical way. Yeah, I mean, it's a big leap, right? Because because ultimately that's taking on a lot more responsibility. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that like people are taxed. Yep, it's true. And so if people don't even, if people don't even function with the emotional resilience in which to handle the taxing things that are, you know, present in their own life, then the ability to care for others is, problematic so again it's starting on that individual and sort of social levels like how do we how do you actually like become a more resilient person well you know i think there's two connections at least we need to make between these sort of economic questions and these emotional questions and one of them is the more now well-known connection of how social media um manipulates people's emotions and never mind the explicit experiments they did even before they were doing that like facebook did those emotional experiments um, I feel like maybe I was in them, but maybe we all were in a way. <laughs> See, they, they still haven't told me if I was in one of those emotional experiments or not. I, I mean, it would explain a lot, but then again, so would a lot of things. But um, <laughs> in addition to that, um, 
this is still within the first thing, before they were even doing that, the mere fact of optimizing for engagement, which is what all these platforms are doing. And it seems like a, that's the story that you'll hear if you watch like Tristan Harris or whatever, that like in the beginning, they thought what's wrong with optimizing for engagement? We want people to use our product. Well, under what conditions do people use your product more when they're angry and polarized? Yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe we should optimize for reducing polarization or reducing something like ideological possession. In fact, um, I, I don't know how workable this really is mathematically, but if you look at say um, Jonathan Haidt, he has these measures of kind of like personality metrics. And it seems to suggest that currently uh, the left has a few more, a, a slightly fewer dimensions in terms of how it would answer questions. Basically on the left, people answer questions more predictably than on the right currently. Um, and you might think that what you want is both sides to answer questions less predictably to break down the two party system in the first place. If you want people thinking individually, you don't want to be able to predict how they answer based on their party affiliation, for instance, or based on like, I'm with this group or with that, that an individual is going to respond. A, a more individual individual is going to respond in a more unpredictable way. And um, I think a social media system like Facebook could easily optimize for this. It could say, we want people to act in a way such that if you gave them, if you gave that whole population personality tests, um, there would actually be more than five dimensions of personality. I mean, because when, when things get really bad, when you optimize for engagement and all you're engaging is a certain kind of hate click factor, probably I feel like people's personalities become more one dimensional because everything gets collapsed to like one or two dimensions or something like that. And I, I think that mathematically, we could be looking at the, the dimensionality basically and saying we, we, we want our society to be more multi-dimensional. So let's programmatically look for where people are acting in a one dimensional way and say, how is the software causing that? Because definitely software is increasing polarization uh, right now. Yeah. Um, uh, but I forgot what the other, I said there's two, two connections that we should make between economics and um, emotions. Mm. Um, well, I'll, I'll remember the other one in a second. Tell me if you if we're Okay, so what I think you're talking about there is, des is, is designing for the right goal. Yeah. And I think that that's often like times not really a part of the conversation. Like, I mean, the field of study that, you know, I, I went through for my master's program, it was like a new concept designing for the right goal, like in social systems, like it's, you know, it's 2010, wow. like what the fuck have we been designing for? <laughs> like, yeah. um, so this is a really, and, and I mean, the right goal, there's a lot of different ways that we can think about how we do that, but a lot of it has to do with participation and imagining the future we want and going backwards and but what I think I think that um it, that is really interesting that you're talking about is that the right goal has to be really attuned to humanity and humans and how we're interacting and I don't um I think that that takes a lot of um like you know, as much as like the algorithm, when we think about the algorithm, it's like designing for that, that, that like nefarious goal, like, because it's just like our like little rat brains that are just like, yeah, I want more, I want more, you know, the, the complexity that, that of, of designing for humanity that pushes us in a new direction is, it's complicated. And there needs, that's like, there's a, a lot of, you know, that's going to take a lot of work to get to a place of like, well, what are we, like, what are we actually optimizing for? And then putting the tests in place of like, are we doing it? Are we not? Like, is it working? Is it moving it in a different direction? And then, you know, iterating and re-evaluating if it's, if it's not the right, if it's not proving to have the right consequence. So I think that like, ultimately, like, that's a, that's a process piece that like is, is left out of a lot of conversations. Um, so that's, that's to me what you're bringing up there, what you're speaking to is that like the process of how we're creating these things has to be way more robust. Well, you know, even in AI, you think they're smart. They're only starting to do this now where um, if you look at interviews with uh, Stuart Russell or um, read the new edition of his book with Peter Norvig, which is by the way, the most cited book in computer science, check it out everybody. <laughs> um, they say, oh yeah, AI used to assume that what you did was define an objective and then try to achieve it. And now they're realizing, oh yeah, like if AI is going to not be dangerous, we have to not do that. You have to assume yeah. the objective is wrong at the outset. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can imagine lots of people who um, make this mistake personally. They, 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 maybe they aim and then they fire, but they never re-aim. Yeah. You know, they're just like, like maybe the guy who gets up every morning to make sure that abortion is made illegal. It's like, 
he's aimed and fired and uh it doesn't sound like he's going to question the direction that he's firing in especially because there's more cognitive dissonance the deeper you get into a cause of like although people do it i mean one of the Koch brothers recently recanted because that's an example of people who they got a lot of money and used it to enforce their vision of the good and one of the brothers is like oh we fucked up like you know i i, I don't know if they were saying they didn't take climate change seriously enough or what it was exactly but um basically they're like yeah, you're funding in the wrong direction it's like yeah and that's what could happen to anybody if they just get a lot of power and try to use it i mean the, the, you hope the power is going to be proportional to the probability you'll uh, not misuse it. Um, well, that could happen on a on a on an individual level, really, really quite easily. You know, you're you're getting towards professionalism and ex- advancing your career, and you know, uh, being being the ideal sort of uh, citizen like worker, and then you wake up at 32 and you're like, what the like, was that even at all yeah, what I, I was? I was supposed to. Well, you did everything you were told you were supposed to. Yeah. That, yeah. That you were told widely. Maybe a, a minority of people told you some of these other things you were supposed to do. And like, oh, well, they're a minority. They don't have to do what they're telling you to do. Or the people that created the most impact and created the programming from the outset, twisted it into a place where like it just was lodged so deep that you didn't, it wasn't like you didn't have the cognitive capacity to even, um, or the emotional sort of, vulnerability to even assess. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think that, again, it's like there's so, all of these things are sort of coexisting in all of these levels. You know, we can see examples of how these, this sort of design error or like process error of in judgment of in, in impacts individuals, impacts systems, impacts culture. Like, it's just like, you know, this has to be, this is a, this is an integrative or integral, um, you know, uh, multi-arising uh, problem set that uh, I think it requires a, quite a few perspective windows to really ad- drill down and, and address. And that's why like, I find the uh, Ken Wilber's integral work and integral um, analysis really, really fascinating because um, it doesn't leave anything out. It like shows how things are manifesting and popping up and, and, and echoing themselves from all perspective windows. Yeah, um, it reminds me a little bit of Richard Wolf saying that certain conversations that people will have now in like a, a worker co-op of whether to get the new people also to be members or just employees or something that they often, often it's a repeat of debates that happened like 100 years ago and that there's mm. like a disconnect. So it, also, it just keeps cycling rather than like, okay, but we ruled out that, what's the better way to do it, blah, blah, blah. And he also points out they never really did that. They didn't really do it in America or the USSR to have lots of worker management but as far as um I, I forgot the second thing i was going to say but i feel maybe i merged them into one and i'll i'll review it later and see if it's important but um um on the multiple perspectives window i, I wanted to mention something that i was going to leave um to the end because it's meta and there's already a lot of podcasting about podcasting but i wanted to talk about this idea of decentralizing podcasting mm-hmm. uh, because one of the one of the um examples i'm hoping to set here is that literally anybody can do this um, and there's so many, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're an educated person, um, but it's, it's maybe a slight more obligation for people who society has invested in by giving them funding to learn this or that, that maybe um, they should say, how does this connect to the public conversation? Because there's lots of professors who will never go on YouTube. And it's like, like you could do it once a month for 30 minutes, you know, and there are, I mean, there are professors who do, it's just a different breed. It's an early technology. It's or like, in those who are successful right now, it's partly because they're early adopters of an early technology, but they used to joke that everybody would have a podcast, but everybody doesn't. Everyone has a Facebook profile, but everyone has a podcast. But I'm not sure that Facebook is the greatest way for us to work through such difficult disagreements. Like maybe it's good for cat photos or something. And um, I think it's as simple as everyone recording a Zoom meeting and uploading it. And um, the decentralized part just has to be that you don't keep repeating the same configuration all the time. Because that's what, that's what I was saying earlier about like sort of the curse of oligarchy is that if it's the same subset in charge all the time, over time, it will reflect their interests. And so like, you know, luckily there aren't a lot of like, you know, like Sam Cedar's not a tyrannical host of a majority report, but I'm sure it reflects his interest in some way that he's been doing it for 10 years. That being said, that podcast is already very decentralized in the sense that there's lots of different voices on there. Like, yeah, they're all left voices. They'll have a lot of callers to disagree with and all that kind of stuff. And and they're not shy of disagreeing and, and actually showing footage from the other side and picking it apart and so on. So they're I think they're a real model example as far as like, at least as how far decentralized the old model can go of like, you have a company, you have a studio, you have a place where it's all done and so on and like a specific brand and all this kind of thing. 
But in addition to that, we need just everybody talking. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's maybe it's a detail whether you upload it or not, because, you know, like, you know, it, it, for some purposes, it's not a detail at all. But like, um, you know, if people are afraid, because a lot of people are afraid, there's a huge silencing effect of, of people, are, people are afraid to talk about anything um, that might get them in trouble. Um, and, uh, you know, changing the government might get you in trouble. <laughs> Trying to change the whole system. I mean, someone's not going to like it. it if, if, you do, if you piss off no one, you're not really doing activism is my view. So it, for public facing conversations, I think we need kind of a collective solidarity of everybody saying like, yeah, we're going to have public conversations because that's our duty as members of a democracy. Maybe not every last person, but a certain number of people need to be having participating in public discourse for it to work. And um, there needs to be a solidarity there of like, yes, we, we are going out here with the intention of someone will be upset with what we're saying. Otherwise, we're not talking about the right stuff. Yeah, and it, I, that's really interesting. And, and I, I completely agree with you. And, and just to add to that, I would say, you know, I think a lot of the times the reason why people, um, people, uh, there's a propensity for sort of a quick sort of like, wait, this isn't, this isn't right. You said something weird. You said something wrong. It's because people actually haven't given it, been given the opportunity to deeply enough explain their perspective and where they're coming from. Yeah. And I think that that's a major, major problem because it's, it doesn't become like, why do you think that? That's not the question that comes to it. It's like the, que the, the response is you're wrong. It's and a starting point. it's nice if that's a starting point like at least i know okay you think i'm wrong okay let's talk about it but it's like how dare you? it's more like how dare you how dare yeah. you be wrong i mean i feel that a lot for things that i think are obvious like how dare you make basic mistakes that like everybody suffers from if we all don't get our shit together kind of kind of attitude and so but i but i, I don't think it's i think it's psychologically a little different the how dare you is more like i must show that i don't agree with you Otherwise, someone will say, how dare you to me, right? There's a, there's a yeah. great logic there. Yeah, um, that's an interesting nuance. The group isn't thinking correctly, but it's not always correct to think as a group, even if the group is thinking correctly. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting nuance. And, 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 you know, and I think that these types of long form conversations, they really do give space for that. And, I, and I, I'm a big prop proponent of that. And I think that there's a lot that can be learn by being curious and building on each other's thoughts and ideas. And I just see that happening in, um, in any sort of, um, in, a, in a way, like, so when I think about Facebook, like I don't see it happening there. And, I, and if I do see it happening there, it's like, I can't even imagine how much time and energy it took for someone to be like, I'm gonna craft the most per perfect response to this only to like, you know, then put it out in the world and be like, did anyone notice? Like, then there's like this level of like anxiety. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just talking about me, but I you think that there's something really, for sure. there's something really, like there's something really problematic about that lack of feedback that like, when you put yeah. something out in the world that like, you don't get, you don't clear, you don't get, you know, enough sort of feedback response to be able to integrate yeah. how people are responding or reacting to you. And um, I think that it, it, it it's very corrosive and it erodes um, social uh, decorum in a way that, um, uh, you know, is, is, is deeply, deeply problematic because if, if, if you saw a, a Facebook, if you were to, like, if you were to act out a thread, act out a Facebook thread, that like, that would be great. <laughs> that would be amazing, right? Like what, like, it would just be like the most, <laughs> that would be the most ridiculous. It'd be a reduction ad absurdum. It'd be like this is what you're actually doing. Yeah. The conversation you're actually having. <laughs> yeah. So you know maybe that's the next project we can work on. Yeah, is, uh, live. <laughs> doing doing like improv uh, improv uh, pop up theater with like a uh, Facebook uh, threads. Well, oh, I, I was thinking someone else gives us a Facebook thread and we're supposed to play certain characters in the thread. Like reading it so the thread is the exactly. script the <laughs> that's exactly yeah yeah exactly just like exactly pop pop it up like in the park like act one <laughs> um yeah. you know adam says something disturbing <laughs> oh my 
god <laughs> now that you ever say disturbing things dissenting let's say let's use that word to, to disturb a false consensus is important yeah yeah i think i think that people might some people might qualify some of the stuff you say as disturbing but dissenting i think is like a little bit more accurate sure i mean or questioning or skeptical or, or what have you um yeah yeah so i i mean i see i see you online i see like the effort that you put into into that to that medium into that format and um i and i've watched you evolve and how you've uh you know because we've we've known each other for a few years and and um, i've watched you evolve and how you manage that and um i mean i i'd be curious to know your ta your take yeah. on it now yeah and well, and there, there you about the energy and effort hmm? and 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 just how you feel about the energy and effort you put in and and and, and what is that like for you huh. well i mean it was it was very different years ago i mean i i at this point you've kind of learned you kind of learn a bit about how facebook works and like like you can tell, I learned to tell when someone isn't reading. And so when I can tell they're not reading what I said, I don't internalize anything they say in response because they didn't read it. Yeah. And and a way to test for this is if they don't follow any of the links in what you say, they're not like reading and doing research. They're just, they just want to talk, but they want to like do it in like, oh, I'm going to get some Facebook points or something. It's just like, it's, um, it's social media addiction when it's in that context. It's like, you want to hit the button right away. You want to do it right away. And that's that dopamine hit. And anything that slows people down and breaks them out of that, like, oh, I don't actually know what that word is. I'll have to look it up. That's, it's really important when you need those speed bumps with social media addiction. I think there's actually an advantage to speaking less clearly on Facebook compared to in person, because in person, someone is going to repair a bit and be like, oh, wait, I didn't actually understand what you meant. And there's a back and forth and an iteration, like successive refinements to make sure you actually understand each other. And then you can get that emotional feedback when someone feels like someone gets the point and then you're actually talking about the thing you're talking about. Otherwise, it's yeah. not you're just wasting time uh, you, if, you, if you don't understand the other person what they're saying you're mostly wasting time like you could be addressing the surface claim for the sake of readers it's true um but as far as like really connecting it's not happening if you don't understand what the other person is saying um and it's not going to happen if someone doesn't want to put effort into under because if you're not just doing the default view it's going to take a second for someone to go oh wait that's not they're not just on autopilot they're not just spouting left or right wing talking points you know so i think it's really important to put speed bumps and to slow people down because people are addicted to social media. And when you, you're addicted to that immediate feedback, like like critical thinking is not that immediate. It's, it's just not that immediate. So you have to put speed bumps to slow people down. Like for instance, you know, saying the phrase ceteris paribus is pretty pretentious compared to saying all is being equal. But if you say all is being equal, people just ignore it. They think it's filler words. They, they, they don't think it's important to what you're saying. Um, but if you say it in Latin, they know they don't know what you mean. And that's, it's important for people to know that they don't know what you mean rather than to assume that you do. Mm, um, that's really interesting. So it, it's, it's, it's better to, um, it's better to speak in a way where people know they don't understand you. Um, because if people think they understand you, they're often wrong. Um, if, it, if it's, if it's off the standard script. Um, so that's something I found, you notice that this is a very unemotional, well, I guess, I don't know, maybe there's a bit of an emotion to this, but it's, it's, um, what I'm describing does involve a certain kind of emotional detachment until you see that someone is making the effort to understand you. And then that's someone that you should engage emotionally with because they're not in the grips of a social media addiction. Um, they're, they're trying to, I mean, not as much, you know? Um, so I think you have to, you have to be, you have to be guarded and careful where you open up emotionally online, because otherwise you'll just get savaged by every troll you encounter. And like, why would somebody think that? Why wouldn't they be more good natured? Why wouldn't like, well, you know, maybe they are in a different environment. You know, maybe that person is, uh, nicer and good natured in a completely different environment. And in fact, we have the data now. We know it's not just who you're talking to online. It's the medium. The medium really is the message on Facebook um, to a, a, a great degree. And um, and when you realize that, you don't take it as personal. You realize this is partly Facebook's fault. And and you realize that you're trying to speak through this weird fil mesh filter or something, like whatever it is, trying to talk through the hole in a wall, like in Midsummer Night's Dream or something. Um, and um, yeah, you learn to attribute things to other causes. It's not all just you. It's, first of all, there's an audience as well, so um, it's it's not just you and that person that you're that you're engaging with. Um, that's probably I guess that's probably at least that's the first that comes to mind in terms of changes over over the years. I mean, I've done a lot of trying to post YouTube to Facebook because 
um, YouTube has been my way out of being overly addicted to Facebook. And Facebook does have kind of a monopoly. So I think Facebook is part of the solution. So I think YouTube is the cure to Facebook addiction. Um, it's, a, you know, just like marijuana is a gateway drug off of many drugs, I think YouTube is the gateway drug off of Facebook. And it's very telling that if you, I share YouTube links all the time, Facebook massively down regulates them because they're the competition. In fact, I can see this very directly. I already knew this from reports. If I make, make a music video, a piano video, the Facebook video will get way more interaction on Facebook than the YouTube video shared on Facebook. It's, it's just, it's not about the collective interest, it's about their bottom line. So you have to put a lot of YouTube content on Facebook for anyone to leave Facebook and go to YouTube. But once they've left Facebook and gone to YouTube, they're gonna hear, hear a person talking, not just like a typed out flame war where the emotions are unclear. Um, and that's why I'm gonna post this on Facebook. That's interesting. I mean, uh, from what I, well, first of all, thanks for sharing your sort of uh, how your approach to, to things have changed. Um, that's, I think that's really interesting. I think you could, you know, te do a little talk on YouTube about <laughs> how to better interact on Facebook. Uh, there's an idea for you. Um, uh, but, you know, what I would say about YouTube, and at least from what I understand, um, and maybe your YouTube looks quite a bit different because of the diverse interests that you have, but YouTube is massively, uh, like the algorithm there is like really like points you in the direction oh, of some don't twisted. Use the algorithm. Okay, let me give a little a little pitch here on how to because you know they're talking about disabling the algorithms. You can do it today yourself. Do the following: limit the number of minutes a day that you look at the Facebook news feed. That's an algorithm, unless you have it in chronological mode. So basically, you're limiting your exposure to these algorithms. So say ten minutes a day is what you spend looking at the Facebook news feed not engaging with a post that you already chosen, like talking to a person, but just the scrolling on the newsfeed, maybe 10 minutes is good just to see what your friends shared. Cause it's important. Your friends are sharing stuff. Like maybe they found a good article, whatever it is, you know, something that's going to revolutionize democracy or who knows. And um, you know, this is not counting the time you spend reading that article or talking to someone. I'm just like the scroll, the exposure to the algorithm. So limit to maybe 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is, Facebook newsfeed. And um, on YouTube, don't look at the recommendations and turn off autoplay. Um, I only look at um, my subscriptions. So manually subscribe to a bunch of YouTube channels and uh, subscribe to email things, whatever, you know, RSS, Google News, anything like that. That's all manual. And you choose what you're subscribed to. And then I just go through my subscriptions. I make a short list like add to queue, add to queue. That's my short list. And then I skip a bunch of those as well to save time. But at no point was the algorithm involved in any of that. The algorithm was involved initially in me finding channels. So that's why I do sometimes ask people on Facebook, like what Facebook channels am I missing? Although what I've discovered, especially in talking to people with this decentralized podcasting idea is that there is a giant uh, hole on YouTube on the left. There's not, there's a dearth of leftist content, especially from Canada on YouTube. The, the right wing um, got there first to YouTube. And so be, it, the, that, that part is not the medium that is the, the leftists being caught with their pants down. They need to go to YouTube. This is similar to saying that if you want to change the votes in America, you can move to a rural community and vote Democrat there. You know, if you think of YouTube, if you think YouTube is a bunch of right-wing hicks, then we better get there pronto, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's like when I first learned about decentralized software, I was learning about um, Curtis Yarvin, aka Mensch's Moldbug developing Urbit. And he was ousted out of conferences for being too right-wing and uh, possibly a white nationalist. And like, um, I mean, you can debate what his real views are, but I thought at the time, I was like, Christ, the far right is developing software. Oh, they're, they're, they're on it. They're trying to develop the new software that will replace Facebook or whatever. And as far as I know, on the left, they're not really doing it. The only example I really know is Audrey Tang. I mean, uh, she identifies as a conservative anarchist. So make of that what you will. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, I would say it's a, it's a heck of a lot. The, the, what Audrey Tang, what's happening in Taiwan, it's a heck of a lot more socialist and democratic than what the right-wing YouTube libertarians would have you uh, believe in. Interesting. Yeah. Well, those are great tips. And um, yeah, I, I hope there are some people out there that have got this far that can, that will hear. One hear day, that. They, they might not all listen to it today, but I think eventually someone will go, what is this podcast live stream of consciousness? How does it even start? Look back <laughs> and watch this and be like, whoa, it started with, with literally anybody can do this. Literally anyone can, yeah. So yeah, well, thank you so much for reaching out and um, instigating the conversation and instigating this type of 
um, this type of public conversation. And I mean, I listen to podcasts all the time. Me too. I yeah. Like spend like a few minutes making one and then go back to listen to them. Yeah. You know, cool. you know, this is related to what I was saying with Facebook. You want to take more in than you put out. Otherwise, you know what you're talking about. Well, that's so, like people who are typing more than they're reading on Facebook. Sometimes that's the problem that they're not like, maybe somebody gave you enough to read. By the way, the other thing is over time, I've started to use Facebook more like Twitter just because people don't read that much on Facebook. So if you say something shorter, uh, at least you know which part they they even read. Because <laughs> if, I, if I write three paragraphs and somebody gets angry, I don't know which sentence made them angry. Yeah. So break it down. I, I try to break it down to, into parts. But a, a, a long format like this is more is better for context. For context, I think I think Facebook is better for taking things out of context. Yeah. Yeah. yeah certainly. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, I guess we'll leave it. We we'll leave it there. If yeah, thank uh, you so much, um, and um, I hope everybody watching this um, does it too. I'm going to consider this. I feel like there's a few people that I could have some pretty. Uh, inspiring conversations yeah, I mean, you know if, if people don't want to do it publicly just do it privately whatever like it's not it's not like you don't have to be a prof like that's just one idea well you know the, if there's one message i would like to deliver in every possible context it's edit the rules and pass it on if if activism doesn't do this activism will operate according to the same rules and we need mm -hmm. activism to work better than it did before so there has to be a change in the rules by which activism operates and uh, rather than having a, a centralized authoritarian activism that says, I know how to do activism. You all listen to me. I am the organizer. You, I am organizing you. Everyone needs to organize each other and take turns being, being the host or starting the conversation or, or whatever it is, um, whether it's hosting an event or having a, a conversation or anything like that. It's, it's, um, I think we should, from the bottom up, build in the idea that you're constantly changing who's organizing because that's not how our government works at all. I mean, for you. Yeah. <laughs> that there's an top, and like all these other people stay the same it's like we can at least see how far that mode of organizing can go because um it, but, but it's built into it that you edit the rules when you pass it on like like for instance right now this is operating according to certain rules one of the rules is that there's not many rules basically like for me it's <laughs> unconstrained but you could go do one with a different rule and say well for this one you have to actually read something <laughs> okay <laughs> you know for example um you know anyone could change the rule or this one uh, it does have a you know a, a, a stable host setup or something but that's that's the the basic idea that like that people have to take it into their own hands of editing the rules themselves the rules that they operate by and the rules that activism operates by Report. oh <laughs> i i am inspired by your tenacity and uh vigor keep, well, keep tenacity let's let's keep abortion legal Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> Send me that movie. I'm gonna watch it in horror and be like, "Oh my god!" It's I, yeah. I'll, I will. It's uh, it it made me cry. It really did. I understand. Yeah. Um, but on a lighter note, I'm happy. I'm I'm really happy we got to connect, and um, I always enjoy talking to you. So, uh, Likewise. you know, if it's if we could maybe make a rule that we could do it again. You know. I think I think we should do it again as long okay. as we each do our own first. I think I think that okay. I think that sets an example for how to decentralize podcasting. That's totally fine. That's totally fine. You're you're you are I'm, I'm I to to to, a, to an extent at this point I'm following your lead until I have a little bit more uh, uh, motivation yeah, well, and knowledge to yeah. All right. Well, pleasure beginning this evolutionary process. Love it. All right. We'll talk to you soon, Jenny. Bye. Cheers.